I'm Sebastian Mafud, and you're listening to WCAT Radio, the on-air wing of En Route Books and Media, bringing you the dulcet sounds of Catholic wisdom. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of Purified by Fire. I am David C., and this is the spiritual friendship show to help you find peace, love, and joy in family and work life, sanctified in the world one soul at a time. We are here each and every week to help you grow spiritually, to become successful in this life, and to be a saint for the life after. No matter how broken you may be, God is calling you to greatness that only you can fulfill. So come join us and see how he may be calling you. Hello, everyone. This is David Cease, your host at Purified by Fire and um, at the Fairfax Studio. Today's episode is about the virtue of temperance. It's the last of the four cardinal virtues that we were, were on this journey to discuss. This virtue is rarely emphasized in the world, and yet it is so important because the world emphasizes extremes. A lot of binge drinking, binge activities, such as sports and such, all-you-can-eat restaurants, best cars, great luxury. The lack of temperance causes most of the attachments we have in our lives that need to be slowly cut away to become happy and to become a great saint. One of the most important virtues, especially for first world countries where we can have anything we want, even to the extreme, but ironically, we are never happy. So before we begin with our story, I would like to start with a prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Dear Lord Jesus, we pray that your word may come through this radio station and touch the hearts of the people who are out there, especially on this topic of temperance, that may help us to be more temperate in the way that we behave, both internally as well as externally. Let us pray. O giver of... O God, giver of that ardor of love for you by which St. Lawrence was outstandingly faithful in service and glorious in martyrdom, grant that we may love what he loved and put into practice what he taught. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. So, my story begins um, with a homily. It was a very funny homily. Uh, a couple of months ago, probably the beginning of summer, we had a visiting priest. He was a missionary in third world countries. And he started out with his homily with kind of like a joke. It was funny yet serious. And he talked about this idea of first world problems versus third world problems. As you know, first world problems are, or first world countries are countries that are affluent um, and are very well self-sustained, they have a good economy, stable government, and uh, do very well. Third world uh, countries typically are the opposite, unstable government, unstable economy, uh, a lot of poverty in those countries. And so he was comparing the problems between the two countries. So I'll list a few, of about five of them, uh, what the problems were. So a first world problem is uh, kids open a fully stocked refrigerator and say, there is nothing to eat. I get that from my kids all the time. I look at them and say, we have a fully stocked refrigerator, and they'll say, there's nothing to eat. In the third world country, the problem's like this. Children rummage through garbage to find their food. That's their problem. So in a first world country, we have so much food, yet they have the audacity to say, there's nothing to eat. Another one. In a first world country, the problem is we complain about no electricity for three days. We were out of electricity for three days because we had a hurricane that came along, and we were complaining because 
the internet was down, the phones were down, there was no electricity. We had to turn on a light. We, had, we couldn't turn on a light. We had to use candles. Yet in a third world country, there is no electricity, no running water, nothing, no even, not even plumbing. Imagine that. So we have the audacity to complain when we miss electricity for three days. First world countries complain that they don't have the latest iPhone. You know, maybe they don't have the latest and greatest iPhone. And so they complain, oh, why don't we have, get the best and the latest iPhone? Third world countries, no time to be entertained because they just need to survive. Every day is a survival. And an iPhone is not just, a, it's not even a luxury. It's not even on their radar. Another one, complain that they don't like their job. Oh, I don't like it. It might be the people, it might be the money, it might be lots of things. In a third world country, collecting garbage or walking miles to get any type of job for very, very extremely low wages is what they get. So they're very grateful for what they got. And lastly, in a first world problems, we complain about the wanting their own room in a, a 2,600 square foot house. Do you know that the average house in America is 2,600 square feet? And almost every child has their own room. And we complain sometimes if we have to bunk next to, my, you know, to other people. Yet, in a third world country, they live in no house, possibly a shack, or maybe a shack that's a size, most of the time anywhere from 100 to 200 square feet with multiple family members living in one single room. So imagine that. And yet, if you ever visit a third world country, I did a lot of, uh, we, when I was living out in California, I built houses for the poor for, uh, in, down in Mexico, a third world country. And if you ever met them, they're very smiley, they're very friendly, they're very nice people down there. And yet, they have hardly anything. You know, First of all, country, we have everything, yet we're very unhappy. Why is that? Because it's the state of extremes that has caused us to be attached to items. I'm going to give you an example. I was, at a, uh, I was down in Washington, D.C. this past couple of days for a business trip. I was meeting some high-powered businesses down there. And so one of the gentlemen I was out to dinner with, uh, he was saying how he lives down in Florida at one of the best beaches you can ever think of. Uh, you know, has a beautiful house, has a swimming pool. He's not far from the beach, and he has a swimming pool. And so he was talking about how his kids are tired of it. They treat the beach and a swimming pool like it was just Walmart. So it's amazing how we can get easily tired of the things that we have the best of something. So why are we so unhappy? Well, we've got to look at it from this standpoint. One of the things that I really, really loved when I was growing up, oh, not growing up, but in my newfound faith uh, many years ago, was reading St. John of the Cross. Uh, and he said this one quote, which I really loved, which was, is to be detached. He was an emphasis of detaching. And he would basically say that if you really detach, it's when you really love something, you know. Uh, a good example of that is uh, I, one of my biggest problems I have is, is eating, and I frequently have to, you know, worry about that. Uh, and so, you know, one time I was talking to a friend of mine, he says, why do you like these all-you-can-eat buffets? And I just told him I like to eat. That's all I do. He goes, it doesn't even taste that good. He's like, why do I just like to eat? So the point I'm getting at is that you know, eating is, is what we're addicted to. It doesn't even taste that great. So why do we do that? Because we're at extremes. We don't have the temperance to help regulate that. Another example of this unhappiness is drugs and addictions. Now, that's going pretty extreme, but I want to, you know, we sometimes use this extreme example. No one ever grows up and says, you know what, I'm going to grow up to be a drug addict 
or I'm going to grow up and be an alcoholic, or I'm going to grow up and become a sexaholic. None of, them, no, none of us do that. But what happens is we wind up attracted to these items because it gave us a certain pleasure. You know, maybe it was alcohol gave us that buzz. We were able to freely do what we wanted to. But sooner or later, we drank more and more and more, and or we did the addiction. And in the beginning, you were the master of that of that drug or alcohol when you first started. But then the master became the slave, and that is the drug and alcohol becomes your master. Right, you're addicted to that, and then through that addiction, that cold drug or that cold alcohol, it don't care, and it will destroy your life. Here, where I live, and probably most of America, opioids is the number one, uh, you know, killer of of teenagers. And why? Why is it? Because opioids have this issue where you constantly have to use more and more and more of it to get that next high. You can't use the same amount because it won't get you high anymore. So sooner or later, it's just a recipe for drug overdose. So that's what happens. We become so attached. And so it's not just drugs and alcohol that we get attached to. It, we get attached to many things. It, we get attached to uh, you know, food. We get attached to luxury. We get attached to you know, uh, sports, all of these things. And so those attachments, though, are hard to give up once you're attached to them. But if you truly want to be happy, you'll want to cut those attachments, all of them, not just the ones that, you know, are easy and brag about how easy I gave up this or that, but all of those attachments. I believe it was St. Therese that said that if a bird would, even if a bird can't fly, even if it was tied to a string that was the size of a thread. It doesn't matter if it was chained up with chains or a thread, it still can't fly. So we have to get rid of all those attachments to be, truly be happy. Because the reason why we're not happy is because they become masters of our own lives where we get tired of them. So temperance, temperance teaches us to be temperate with our items and to use them appropriately for where, for how uh, we need to use these items. So we're going to talk a little bit about temperance. So what is temperance, okay, and why? So one of the things that I like to emphasize about temperance is we talked about justice several days ago, or several Fridays ago, and Saint, I believe it was St. Augustine called it uh, the tranquility of peace. So if justice gives us peace, then fortitude, which we just talked about a couple Fridays ago, gives us success because it helps us to either be patiently endure or to overcome obstacles through courage. And so it makes us a success. But temperance helps us to be happy. It really does. Because going at the extreme doesn't really make us happy. It creates uh, an inordinate attachment to something that eventually will make us unhappy. In some cases, might even cause us to kill ourselves, like addictions. So temperance, what does it do? So we talked about the soul, and we talked about how we have an intellect and the will, we have our passions, and then we have our external uh, senses. So the temperance helps us to regulate the external senses, you know, uh, the sound, so the hearing, sight, smell, taste, and feelings. So that's what it does. It helps us to regulate those. Because if, our, if we operate through our senses, if our senses is what drives our life, and we get our will to dry, to to basically um, have our senses 
you and I'll drive our will and our passions, then we will drive – those senses will go crazy. This is where addiction comes into play, is that when we cannot regulate our external senses. Because unlike animals, we have a will. And once we have a will, we can go extreme into whatever senses that we like. You know, so if our desire is for that drug, we will do everything that will it takes to get that drug. Or if our desire is to go and eat food, we will do everything that we can to eat that food. Animals can't do that. Animals, in most cases, we can train them to do that. Yes, we can train them. But by nature, they can't do that. All right? So we can train animals to do that, but we are the ones who have the intellect and the will to basically do things in extremes. And when our will and our passions are focused on our external senses, then that's not that good. So that's what it does. So temperance regulates the external senses. Uh, now, we've got to understand, our senses aren't bad. In fact, God gave us our senses so that we can, uh, for self-preservation, right? So we should feel hungry and we want to taste that food. You know, it would be horrible if food tasted bad, right? No child would have eat food if food tasted bad, right? Look, look at, you know, try to give children broccoli, you know, but you can give them a cookie, right? So uh, we do, so the senses are important, but it's when we go beyond those limits that they become addictive or changes our behavior, okay, that causes us to be, have bad behaviors. Um, so what are, the, what are the vices? Remember we talked about how virtue is basically this nice, fine balance between you know, two extremes. Too much of it, like water, too much water, we drown. Not enough of it, it's a drought, so we, we, we can die of lack of, of water. Just enough helps us to clean, to cook, and for drinking. So what are the two extremes in a temperance? Well, the first one is very easy, intemperance. When someone is not temperate, that's too much of it, right? So they're, they're extreme on eating, you know, we call that gluttony, or they're extreme on um, uh, other things. Maybe it's uh, alcohol, maybe it's uh, sports, maybe it's, it's, you know, other, other objects. So maybe it's work. So temperance. The other is insensibility. That's the opposite. That's when you don't have uh, any type of, uh, well, you don't want to have any pleasure at all that goes with it. Because remember, there are legitimate pleasures. So we shouldn't be seeking pain all the time, but the, the certain pleasures are legitimate. You know, so uh, that's okay. Eating a nice meal or uh, it, it's okay to taste good. It's okay to have, you know, air conditioning and those types of things. But uh, insensibility is the opposite. Now, most people don't fall under that category, but they do fall underneath the intemperance side. Where insensibility comes into play sometimes is when uh, you get diehard Catholics who lives such an austere life that they lose all purpose of what austerity is for, okay? Um, I, I've met a few who are like that, where pe they're so austere that it's, it's the purpose of austerity is not uh, to be kind of like a game or – because some people are very good at being austere, all right? And so they just pride themselves to become this great austere person, when uh, austerity to an extreme isn't really holiness, you know. Uh, holiness is really uh, being loving, and there's times not to be austere. And I'll give you an example. One of the rules of St. Francis, we know we have to do penance and everything, but penance, you know, in the context of ourselves, not in the context of the world. So I'll give you an example. So if... Uh, fasting is one of the things that I do. If I'm invited for dinner, I'm not going to go to my friend's house and say to the person, I'm fasting right now, I'm not going to eat. 
right? I'm going to actually enjoy that meal and eat it. This person, you know, who invites you to dinner wants you to have this meal and, and for you to enjoy it. That's the whole purpose of it. That builds the friendship and that builds on the idea of love. It would be wrong to repudiate the food to say, oh, I'm fasting for today. So it's important to understand, and this is why I tell people, fasting is not dieting, and dieting is not fasting. I always say that because we are not to fast uh, when it comes to relationship, because this is not their penance. This is your penance. So it's understand. So, so, it's, so sometimes people are, have that insensibility, especially I find that Catholics who want to try to become the great austere saints and everything, uh, and they rule the, you know, and they do all these things. But in reality, a great saint would not be austere when it comes to uh, opportunities to evangelize and talk to people and have to provide that food. Now, that doesn't mean that you have the right to go and eat all their food and everything like that. No. What we're saying is, you know, you should be able to eat that food and not feel guilty about it and, and reduce that austerity because then you're really losing the purpose of, of penance. So, the, you know, temperance. So now what are the integral parts? What are the parts of it, of uh, temperance? There's two things that we have to understand that helps us to be temperate. And society has really, really destroyed these two parts that may help us to be uh, temperate. One is a sense of shame. All right, we we've really really had this idea that we shouldn't shame other people. You know, growing up, shame on you. Remember, I remember uh, growing up, and people would say, "Shame on you." I watched Little House on the Prairie, and they'll say, "Shame on you." Shame, shame, shame. And I think that rarely happens nowadays in today's society. But Society did that because that built up a sense of consciousness that we should be shame, that we should have a sense of shame uh, when we do something wrong. Okay, not overly guilty in a sense of, of uh, a guilt trip, but a shame like, oh, you know, that I, I feel so ridiculous about this. But we have society now that has eliminated shamefulness, and so there is no conscientious behavior. So women are running around in modest clothes. They have no shame. They have no, you know, no shame that they could go to church and wear, you know, these either tight clothes or shorts that are so short, they're almost practically underwear, all right? And they have words on their, you know, bottom area, you know, physically attracting them. There's no shame. Uh, shame is one of those old school things where you know you're just causing bad. Con- it's it's bad self esteem to have shame, and that's not the case. Shame prevents us from doing things that are wrong. When I was in the Marine Corps, peer pressure is very very high there, and there was good purpose for peer pressure because when you're in combat, you want to make sure you do everything right because you want to make sure everyone is uh, properly doing the right thing because we've got to cover each other's back. There's no room, you know, and you were shamed. You were picked out. You made a mistake. The whole platoon suffered. That's what it was. And it was a shameful tactic that caused peer pressure. So shame. So we need to have that sense of shame to come back. Tell our kids. That's a shameful behavior. So they know what's right or wrong. The second is a sense of honor. Now, we have replaced, the world has replaced a sense of honor with a sense of individualism out there. There's no sense of honor anymore, none whatsoever. The close, even the military is starting to get, uh, you know, hammered a little bit on that. You know, we, we replaced it with professionalism, we replaced it with individualism, but at the end of the day, a sense of honor is what you want. It's the opposite of a sense of shame. Shame is we should feel guilty because we did something wrong, but a sense of honor is a sense of proudness that we have because we did something right. 
and something that's good about us, right? And it's amazing because when I was in the Marines, you know, I behaved totally different when I wore my dress blues than when I wore civilian gear, right? This is why I firmly believe that priests should always wear uh, their priestly garb. They should always be wearing their, uh, the white collar because there is a sense of honor that goes in with your clothes. There is a sense of behavior. You know, I went to, um, I, just recently I, I took my son to buy a suit, and a sign up there says, you know, dress to be like a million dollars. Dress for success, Right? The pitch there is saying that you want to be a millionaire, that you've got to dress like one. Why? And it's true. Because the one who dresses like a millionaire will act like he's a millionaire. And the one who acts like a millionaire and who's confident that goes into that room will get the job. That's dress for success. All right? It was the same thing. When I wore my dress blues, I acted proudly with honor and dignity because I knew people were looking at me as a Marine, Marine in my uniform. It's the same thing with priests and bishops. They need to wear their priestly garb and religious as well. It's very easy to fall and slip. All right? Why do you think there's dress codes you know, in the military to remind us that we have this, we're putting on our war clothes And priests have a sense of honor wearing those clothes. So we need to have a sense of honor within ourselves, that we have that, and we're called to a greater greater, uh, aspect than just this, hey, I'm just walking around. So we've got to have that sense of honor. And what great honor do we have than to be called a Christian? Today is Deacon Lawrence's feast day, who, who had a, a you know, horrible martyrdom, but that he had a sense of honor because he knew that he was a deacon, a servant of a, the greatest servant of all, which was Jesus Christ. The diaconate represents the servanthood of Jesus Christ. I firmly believe that just like on the day that uh, Christ instituted the priesthood um, at the Last Supper. He also instituted the diaconate at the Last Supper. And where he, he instituted it was in the washing of the feet, where he said, look, you call me master, which I am, but I am serving you and washing your feet. I think that's where the diaconate began. And it's interesting how how he he did that first and then he instituted the priesthood in the uh, in in the uh, words of consecration because he said I want my priest to first learn how to serve to serve as a deacon then to serve as my priest and then the perfection of the priesthood and the bishop becoming a bishop so it's so important so the great honor that, that, that uh, the Holy Orders has, and the great honor that the religious have, and the great honor that even you know, the, uh, the marriage state has, which is reflected in Mary and Joseph, who had the great honor of being husband and wife and mother and father to Jesus, the great holy family. So all of that, what is that great honor? So what's the other integral parts? The next is uh, abstinence, right? Part of temperance is abstinence. Well, of course, we know gluttony is the, uh, is the opposite of that, to uh, ver- practice that virtue. Next is sobriety. You're going to find that most of the integral parts of temperance will be wrapped around two areas. And it's not to say that the other areas aren't important. But there's two areas that it will focus on. It's basically taste and feelings, or, or a sense of, of feeling. 
not emotional feelings, but you know, sense of feeling, touch, we should call it, sense of touch. And sense of touch, the reason why is human sexuality. So abstinence, abstaining is, uh, helps us with, with gluttony. Uh, the virtue of sobriety helps us with drunkenness. Uh, I, you know, I have, I used to have issues with drinking. You know, in my business, uh, and uh, this will be some other time, but I will, you know, I've had a big issue with drinking to the point where I don't drink anymore. And I, you know, and I'm glad I don't drink anymore. But the biggest thing is that I grew up with a drinking problem through high school, through college, and then in the military, and then being an entrepreneur, there's nothing but drinking, drinking and eating. All right, you go to meetings, you do all these things. And so uh, drunkenness, you know, is the opposite of sobriety. So practicing that, controlling your drinking. Uh, chastity, the actual uh, uh, chastity where you control uh, the, con- the human sexuality, you know? Do you, bl- do you know that all of us are called to be chaste? Religious as well, priests, as well as uh, people who are single and people who are married. All of us are called to chastity. What's the difference, though? Well, for the religious and for, for uh, the priesthood, they abstain from human sexuality. That's what they do. For, uh, as well as single life. The single life, they abstain from sexuality. In the married state, we have to be chaste just as much as the others because why? Because the human sexuality is only for our spouses. That's it. All right? So yes, we can indulge in human sexuality, but that's only with our spouse. That's all. All right? One man, one woman. That's where we, we, we focus on. So we are all called to chastity, regardless of what state we're in. Now, whether we abstain or whether we only have, uh, and, and in essence, we also have to, the marriage state, we have to abstain, right? We have to abstain from other, for many other women, for my wife, other men, because we can only reserve it for our spouse. So my wife to me and me to my wife, that's it. And that takes uh, the virtue of chastity, purity. All of us, regardless of what state we're on, have to practice purity. Why? Because that virtue is the virtue that leads to the union. So if you don't keep yourself uh, pure, then it's hard for you to be chaste. Okay? It really is. So I have to be pure. You know, there was a question one time that says that someone said, "Can I lust after my wife?" You know, it was a, I forget I was going to a moral theological website, Catholic one, and and a, a person asked, and he says, "Can I lust after my wife? Can I dream about sexuality of my wife?" And the priest, who was very good, said, "No, you can't." And he gave several reasons why, uh, you know, but. The main reason why, you know, in, in this case of temperance, is that, you know, your spouse is not an object that you, for meant for, for pleasure. It's a self-donation, all right? So purity, keep yourself pure. Because I can tell you, a person who's not keeping themselves pure, even within their spouse, good chances are they're not keeping themselves pure on other matters. It's not just to their spouse, it's probably to, you know, to other, to other uh, women or men. So purity, so all of us, my, I have to stay pure so I can protect my virtue of chastity to keep it with my wife. And then the uh, single life and the religious life and the priesthood, they have to stay pure so that they can abstain from, from it. And of course, virginity. That is abstaining from union. All right? So those are very important virtues. Now, we have some sub-virtues that we can get or, or auxiliary virtues that we can talk about and how they impact us, how these auxiliary virtues help with temperance. 
The first is countenance. Okay? So we talked about temperance. Temperance helps us control our external senses. All right? So when, you know, I am eating, I should be able to say, okay, that's enough, you know, right reason. But that's only controlling the, the senses. But there's also one thing that we also have to control is our passions. When we're passionate about food or we're passionate about luxury or when we're passionate about certain things, it can drive our senses crazy. You know, I call our passions the engine of getting things done. So if our passion is into food, chances are you're going to eat a lot of food. Okay? So countenance helps us to control our passions. Anger, okay, because there's temperance and anger as well. Anger, you know, that's part of our, our passions. And so countenance helps us control that anger and use it for right purposes. Because anger is not wrong. It's just that we can't be using it uh, and get angry very quickly. So countenance helps us control and strengthens our, our, um, our way of controlling our passions. You know? So the next is meekness. Meekness helps us moderate anger with right reason. So as I said, anger is not wrong. As, an, as a passion, it's not wrong. All right. A lot of people. It, the world has almost gotten to the point where, where if you're if you are angry, there must be something wrong with you. You're evil, and in some cases that's true. But you are able to be angry. All right. Uh, so, for example, you know we talk about Jesus being meekness, but you know he made a whip out of, out of uh, cord and started throwing, uh, you know money changers out, and I would assume that he's probably yelled at them. I can't see him, you know, throwing things down the floor and, and basically making a whip and whipping them out the door and then him just saying, you are bad. You are really bad. Now, he would probably have some emotional, uh, you know, yelling going on and telling them that, you know, this is my father's house. Or, or look at the, the great prophets of old when they would have to tell you know, people who committed sin. You know? um, it's, they were probably very forceful. You know? They weren't non-emotional. So anger, justifiable anger, is legitimate. So the problem that we face is that most of our anger comes from frustration. Most of our anger comes through uh, disproportionate to what we should be angry about. So in other words, they're not justifiable to be the anger that we have. So that's where most of us come. So this is where meekness comes into play. The virtue of meekness helps us regulate when we should be angry and when we shouldn't be. Okay? So uh, what are the vices of meekness? Remember, we talked about opposite extremes. First is cowardice. Meekness is not cowardice. That's something that's really, I see that all the time, how people use meekness. They, they hide behind meekness and hide behind uh, humility to basically be a coward. That's basically what it is. Oh, I'm just being meek. We're going to be meek like, like Jesus. Okay? No, Jesus wasn't meek. All right? Uh, you know, they, they didn't just take him and, and crucify him. He chose to be crucified. There's many instances in the Bible where people try to grab him and throw him off a cliff, and all of a sudden, he just walks past them. Okay? So he chose to die. So, you know, cowardice. We, we use meekness as an excuse and false humility as an excuse to be a coward because we're not meant to be cowards. The, the second or the opposite side is anger, vengeful anger, you know, unjustifiable anger or extreme anger. All right, that's not appropriate either. So the virtue of meekness helps us regulate our anger. The next is clemency. All right, clemency is the virtue that inclines a person who is in authority to mitigate the punishment. Now, this is very important because a lot of times when we get angry, we wind up uh, being excessive. You know, I know as a, when I had my first couple of children, I was very excessive, both in my punishment as well as in uh, what caused me to get angry. 
And so I learned a lot to become meek, but also to, to be, uh, have some clemency, which is the idea that we can, uh, you know, with right reason, mitigate those punishments. You know, the vice of that on the far right is cruelty and savagery. Now, you, you can read the Bible. Oh, no, I'm sorry. Read the news, and you can see the savagery that goes on with some of the behaviors that people go through and, you know, uh, abusive behaviors that parents do because of the idea of clemency, the lack of it. Uh, the, um, but on the other hand, we have excessive leniency. There, there's a lot of times where our leniency is too excessive, and that's where most Americans fall. It's, it's a shame right now because, and I see it all the time, is that parents don't, are too lenient. It goes hand in hand with the idea of sense of shame. They don't want to confront their kids. And it's not that, you know, we should be, you know, I think what happened was society got so much to the extreme on the right half where, you know, peer pressure, shamefulness, and, um, and maybe cruelty and savagery to our kids, that now the pendulum has shifted to the other side where it's like self-esteem is so disproportionate now. And first of all, it's self-esteem based off of wrong parts of it, you know, uh, self-esteem based off of, you know, worldly behaviors as opposed to being a child of God, that we really have gone on the opposite side where we shelter our kids. We don't give them a sense of shame and wrongness anymore because, you know, now it's like if you tell them it's wrong, oh, it might, you know, hurt their self-esteem. So the leniency is too much. The excuses why kids are the way they are as opposed to holding them accountable in what they should be doing. That's the issue that we run into now, extreme clemency or actually a clemency that's going excessive leniency. So parents need to be able to say to their children, shame on you, that was wrong. That, that is wrong. Building that consciousness of right or wrong and also giving them punishment, okay, as long as not excessive, so they can unconnect the dots of I've done something wrong, I now have to face punishment. But clemency helps us to regulate that through right reason. When to be, give them, you know, some clemency. When you can mitigate those punishments and when not to. The next is modesty. You know, now modesty is not just about wearing good clothes. Okay, that is not what modesty is all about. We have this idea is that, I mean, certainly that's part of it. But it's modesty in behavior as well as modesty in, um, in externally as well. So it's modesty internally as well as modesty externally. So what is modesty externally? Modesty externally is very easy. It's just the way that you behave and dress. All right? So I'll give you an example. You know, we wear modest clothes. Right? So we're not excessive on that aspect of it. We speak modestly. All right? How often do we do excessive cursing or OMG or all these things that go on instead of doing that? Modesty in the way that we think inside, how we, we are. Um, I remember uh, listening to, I think it was a Christian radio or someone uh, or maybe it might have been a saint, I don't know. Uh, but I remember reading about an aspect of it that uh, a young uh, a father once said to a friend who was a father of a 15-year-old, and he said, wow, your daughter has become very, very attractive. And the father turned around and said, how dare you say that? Listen to that. How dare you say that my daughter is attractive? And so the other father went, like, what do you mean by that? And he goes, 
the only way that you could have noticed that my daughter is attractive is to be attracted to her in some sense, some sense in an impure fashion. Now, I'm not saying that, you know, uh, we've got to be careful about that, but there's a moment of truth in there that for that person, that father, that man, to find out that this, this 15-year-old is attractive, to say that had to be, at one time, thinking of some kind of attraction or impure thought. Attraction. Now, we understand that. Now, as men, we might do that. But the point is, is as soon as we feel like we're attracted, we've got to shut it down. This is what modesty internally is all about. This is what purity is all about. Shutting it down at the get-go and not making that comment. By expressing that comment, that gentleman unleashed his, you know, saying, and what he wanted was that father's approval. Oh, yeah, she is very attractive. Oh, okay, great. Now I can keep thinking of her in this impure, attractive manner. Instead of, you know, controlling myself and thinking of her as a child of God. So modesty is both internally as well as externally. And how we communicate, how we talk to other people, to so that we can actually shut it down before we start talking about it. You know, why should we be talking? I mean, you know, if, if her 50-year-old, oh, yeah, you look very beautiful, that's fine. Just like flowers. Flowers look very beautiful. I love flowers. Paintings look very beautiful. All right? So, but the sense of attraction, like, oh, I'm attracted to her, that's drawing a different line. And so there has to be an impure thought about that. The next uh, is uh, some, some auxiliary or, you know, virtues is studiousness. Now, this is very important because studiousness controls our desire for knowledge. You know, we have this idea that this knowledge must be, all knowledge must be great. All knowledge is great. But you know what? That was the fundamental flaw of Adam and Eve, right? We go back to Adam and Eve. Do not eat the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, all right? I remember one, I, I did prison ministry, and this one prisoner said, wouldn't you want to know what's good and evil? And so I had to reply back, and I said, they did know what was good and evil. They were told, not to eat this, because that was evil, and, you know, the good is not to eat it. Because if they were to eat it, evil things would happen, because God said you would die. So they already knew it, but they wanted to know more. They wanted to know it for themselves, rather than trusting in God. So there is a limit on what we should know and what we shouldn't know. So studiousness helps us to moderate the desire to, to know. And the vices of there is curiosity. Uh, hence, curiosity killed the cat, right? Because being curious of everything will kill the cat. Sloth and negligence is the opposite. When we don't want to know anything and we're negligent on our behavior because we don't want it. But I want to go through curiosity. Curiosity killed the cat. This example of of, uh, uh, of studiousness, desire of knowledge, there is this idea, or I coined the phrase uh, called holy ignorance. We need to have holy ignorance. And that we need to control our curiosity. All right? You know, if I taught a seven-year-old how to drive a car, or an eight-year-old how to drive a car, or a nine-year-old how to drive a car, they can physically start a car and drive it, but do they have the reason to know what, how to react, how to do things? No, they don't. This is the same thing with sex education. All these, sex ed all these great you know, people said, oh, the problem with promiscuity is that they don't know much about sex. So we taught sex education in high school, teenage pregnancy skyrocketed. So then now they're saying, we've got to teach it down in the fifth grades. 
And you know, now you have you know, kids who are in 7th and 8th grade getting pregnant. And promiscuity in that age has skyrocketed. This is where curiosity needs to be shut down. This is where it is. Curiosity is not good. I mean, we all can say that if a child gets a, a, a knife, a metal fork, and throws it into an electric uh, outlet, you know, because he's curious and knowing that, that's wrong. So we have to understand that all knowledge isn't good. Just like Adam and Eve, all knowledge isn't good. That there are certain knowledges we shouldn't know. You know, another good example of that is after World War II, Nazi Germany had, you know, done many, many research, lots of research, especially biological research, by torturing Jewish people. That's what they did. They experimented on a lot of the Jewish people. And there was a lot of medical discoveries that they had. And so after the war, the scientists came down and said, should we use this knowledge that was found? Even though it could help people, should we use it? And it came out that they would not use it. Because rightly so, they said, even though it could do great works in the future, it, it was at a cost of an evil. So knowledge is not the answer to everything. You know, we need to keep that holy ignorance. And we need to have it. You know, teaching your kids how to drive doesn't mean that they know how to drive. And they can drive. My son got into an accident. And I remember the, the police officer telling my son, before you start your little aunt, because my, my, my son was trying to show off, he got to a car accident, he's 16 years old, and, um, you know, he hit a tree, and he told the police officer, yes, I was showing off, and the police officer said, before you try any tricks in your car, learn how to drive the car. He's only been driving for six months, and he was showing off, thinking that he knew what he was doing. That's what goes on. So we teach our kids about sex, what do you think they're going to try to do? Show off. And that's exactly what's happening. Right? Because just because you know how to drive, just because you knew how to drive a car doesn't mean that you can drive a car and not get into accidents and not kill yourself or other people. And that is what happens when you have too much knowledge and you don't have the wisdom to use it. So the virtual studiousness helps us regulate that desire for knowledge. The last uh, auxiliary uh, virtue is eutropilia. I love eutropilia. My, my, you know, I never heard of that virtue until probably about five or six years ago when my wife, she teaches a, uh, she does, has an all-girls uh, Catholic club called uh, Little Flowers. And she says, she goes up to me, and she knew I was very, I was into the Catholic church. I knew a lot. And she goes, I can stump you on something. And I said, you can't stump me. She goes, what is the virtue of eutropilia? And she stumped me. So I didn't know what it was. But it's basically the virtue of recreation. All right? So recreation is necessary. It is absolutely necessary for recreation. We can, but here's the thing. We can have excessive or out of right reason recreation, or we can have excessive austerity. Those are the two extremes of eutropelia. So where typically we fall under, at least here in the United States, is excessive or out of the right reason recreation. All right, it's the extreme sports. It's the, um, you know, uh, sports that has to be, you have to be the winner. You know, today's sports system has lost the idea of sportsmanship. It really has. You know, when you start hitting, I would say, sports after eight years old, eight, nine years old, they have gotten so competitive. Parents are so competitive. Parents 
you know, I was hearing on the news that a, a, a referee has now started a website to hopefully shame people in, in how parents are blowing things out of proportion and beating up referees when their kids are only 8 or 9 or 10 years old. I mean, we're not talking here professional sports, you know, college sports. We're talking about 8, 9, 10-year-olds and them fighting, physically fighting them. This is excessive. Or thinking that your kids are going to, you know, uh, be this great sports and athlete. So this, this excessive, or how about the fan that is so extreme when they go see a football game or when they go see a baseball game, they're dressed up in all this garb and, you know, they do all these crazy things, right? They know everything about, you know, all the, ba- the, the baseball players. They have fantasy football or they've got all these things, and they're so excessive on that. Can you imagine if there was fantasy saints? You know, hey, what if, like, St. Augustine did this or – you know, or how many people would have how about saint cards? How many people know that it's fast of the saints? How many people they converted? All right, but oh sure, you can ask them about you know what's the average uh, uh, you know batting average of, of some baseball player, or the, the you know the, the reception of of a, of a quarterback, you know, or a receiver. I mean, the, this is excessive. Okay, but it's gotten to the point where it's sportsmanship is not even emphasized anymore. It's winning at all costs. It is the, you know, uh, who is it? The um, the football player, the uh, Vince Lombardi, that said winning isn't um, what is it? What do you say? The winning isn't uh, you know whatever it is. Winning is everything or something like that. So the point I'm getting at is this is excessive because the purpose of recreation comes from the word recreation is to Give our brains a rest so that we can rebuild and recreate ourselves. That's what recreation is all about. Because our minds, and we can't keep working, working, working. We can't have this austere life. We have to, to relax and have that. That's why we have feast days. You know, solemnities in our days we celebrate. Cele- celebrate the solemnities. Have a party. Go out to dinner. Okay? Have that dessert. That's what we do with solemnities. All right? The Catholic Church changed the rule that on solemnities, holy days, Friday is a day of penance for the universal church. So every Friday you have to do some form of penance unless a solemnity falls on that day. All right? That is because she understands that we cannot live an austere life 24 by 7, 365 days out of the year. We need to have recreations. Another great rec- recreation is going on our retreat to recreate ourselves. You know, vacations are meant to be to recreate ourselves. It's okay to go on vacations. In fact, next week, I'll be at Catholic Family Land. It's a great place for recreation because it combines faith, fun, and relaxation. Now, I'll give you this picture. And and next week, I'll probably, um, you know, do uh, my radio station live at Catholic Family Land. But think of this. There's swimming pools, horseback riding, hiking, bicycle riding trails. And the center of all of this is adoration throughout all day, at least four to five priests for confession, all within uh, literally walking distance. And you see all of that. So not only are you at daily mass every single day, all right, and then after the daily mass, you have a mini little retreat and talk about your faith. And they take the teenagers. They, actually, they take all the kids except for, I believe, uh, four and three and under, under. And they give them a little retreats. It's combining that recreation, that sport. Uh, oh, you can play tennis. You play baseball. It's you know all the families come together. We play baseball. This is recreation, both spiritually as well as physically. It's the perfect place to be. So utropilia, controlling our recreation and putting recreation for what is needed. Living a total austere life is not what we're called to either. 
We need to be able to recreate ourselves so that we can be stronger. Just like war, right? We have R and R, rest and relaxation. That's what Utropelia is all about. So that wraps up my talk about um, the uh, temperance, the virtue of temperance, and why it's so important to be temperate so we're not attached to items so that we can regulate them and use them for right reason, right purpose that God intended them, and to helpfully recreate ourselves and build ourselves to become that great saint, that successful great saint that's there. So God bless. Let's end this. We're at the top of the hour. In the name of the Father and the Son of the Holy Spirit, amen. Dear Lord Jesus, help us to follow the virtue of temperance and all its sub-virtues and auxiliary virtues. Help us to understand that we do love you. Help us to be temperate. I know it's easy to be extreme. The only thing we can be really extreme on, and there is no temperance, is the virtue of love. Love of you and love of others. Let us pray that you always help us as we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. Purified by Fire. Please visit us at purifiedbyfire.com. Like us at Instagram and Facebook at purified.fire. Sanctifying the world one soul at a time. you enjoyed the program and will join us back for another show on WCAT Radio. This is Sebastian Mafud. Good day.